All right, time to go home. So I started recording on my way in this morning and uh, this stupid mount that holds my phone while I'm recording had a malfunction and it caused my camera to, uh, my phone to tilt. Anyway, so I'm re-recording, re-recording. I'm recording again on my way home. Um, And uh, I'm going to try and talk about a new word in my lexicon called lethophobia. And uh, I was never aware of this word until a YouTuber or YouTube subscriber saw a video I made, my video on leftist racists, and said, hey, you know what, you should do a video on lethophobia, fear of the truth, and how it's, you know, it's dominating the left now okay a lethophobia I've never heard of it so I looked it up it was a term that was coined by um, by a writer an, an Iranian American writer dude what the hell why are you cutting me off uh, an Iranian American writer and I just I was just reading about him and for whatever reason I've forgotten his name but anyway um, you can look it up he wrote a novel by the same name and published it in 2008 called a lethophobia and it was uh, it was a novel regarding a professor, a fiction um, that was um, had its as its main protagonist a professor, and what he witnessed in academia in America, namely, uh, I guess fear of the truth, people not wanting to be exposed to ideas that they're unfamiliar with or not wanting to expose, be exposed to facts that uh, contradict their worldview. Um, I haven't read the novel, I'm going to order it on Amazon, I got a bunch of Amazon gift cards for Christmas, so I'm going to order it on Amazon and uh, give it a read. Uh, apparently he's pretty prolific, he's written quite a bit, both fiction and non-fiction, about uh, you know, culture, politics, that kind of thing. He's probably right up my alley, I don't know. But anyway, a couple of things I want to order on Amazon, so I'll pick up his book. Alethophobia. So alethophobia is the fear of the truth or an inability to um, to accept uh, facts regarding your, your religion, your nation, your ethnicity, or even yourself. I don't know why the secondary description or definition goes into the specifics of nation. I presume it's because the the author, the person who coined the phrase, it's you know it's integral to his book. But um, you could just say tribes, right? You could say uh, an unwillingness to accept um, facts about your own tribe, or unfamiliar or uncomfortable truths about your own tribe. Um, and I guess, yeah, you could say that that is sort of a, a, a defining characteristic of the modern left, uh, particularly in academia. But, I mean, let me take this hat off. I don't need it on anymore. Um, but also, uh, you know, this isn't, this isn't exclusive to them. Um, when you consider, you know, people on the right are just as guilty of becoming um, resistant to dialogue or resistant to contradicting uh, points of view when it comes to things that they hold hold as deeply held beliefs. But I, I sort of thought about it more and more and I'm thinking it has to do mainly with um, the level of religiosity that you have for your specific worldview. Now, that's not to say that leftism or conservatism or right, rightism, I don't know, rightism is a word phrase to me but uh, conservatism or liberalism or, or leftism or right wing thinking or rightism these aren't necessarily religious ideologies but what I mean is that you can have a religious fervor for your belief in it and I think you find that mostly on the left primarily because there is a um, a system of indoctrination that goes on in academia going all the way down from you know uh, kindergarten all the way through to post-secondary 
where people are indoctrinated to believe certain things about the world that aren't aren't true um and again you see this in academia now with the rise of uh social justice warriors um you know their need for trigger warnings and safe spaces and and, and their tendency to protest just for nonsense causes uh they become indoctrinated in, in a religion of sorts and the same could be said of Christian conservatives all you have to do is look at a Christian conservative uh, who you know who holds in his mind the belief that America is a is American exceptionalism is predicated on uh, almost divinely ordained um, <laughs> A divinely ordained intervention that you know America is great because God loves us now, I think that's kind of you know a simplistic description of a Christian conservative I don't think that's necessarily the case I think most Christian conservatives would say that Christian values uh, are what make America great now people on the left will say ah oh, Christian values and I think what they mean is when, when they hear Christian values they they think you know all the ugliness that you know Christianity has spawned throughout history but for people who are arguing in support of Christian values they're they mean they mean things like charity things like uh, love and, and you know um, forgiveness and that sort of thing and uh, I don't know that those are necessarily exclusively American values but uh, it's tough for me because I'm not a Christian so I don't know where it comes from but I, I want to be an apologist for you know the nicer sections of Christianity who for me you know most Christians are, are decent people and and there are, are more innocuous aspects to Christianity Christianity than there are pernicious aspects and even you know benevolent aspects of Christianity more so than any of the other the many other religions um, so suffice to say I'm an atheist who appreciates Christian values how's that I appreciates the Christian tradition largely because I was raised in Christian tradition. But speaking back to alethophobia, uh, because it's a religious devotion tied to their political beliefs, Christian conservatives are prone to alethophobia, especially when you confront them with the fact that the founders of the Constitution were not, did not fun, find it or did not um, form it as a Christian nation. They were the best to be, they could be at best described as deists, uh, meaning most of them probably believed in a creator but weren't necessarily literal Christians they didn't they didn't hold you know in the necessarily in the historicity of Jesus or in you know the personhood of God um, as a as a specific entity um, that's my take that's my understanding of the of the founding fathers but again I'm not a I'm not a philosopher I'm not a uh, I'm not a religious scholar I'm not a, a historian you know historian Anyway, so again, going back to what I was saying before, alethophobia seems most prevalent amongst those who have a religious devotion to their ideology. That's why you see it on the left, because once I said, as I said, they are indoctrinated from a very young age to believe that the principles of the left um, are not only correct, but are the most morally correct, so that all others are perverse and morally wanting. That's why you find that Christians or left leftists seem even more intolerant than Christians seem to be. Um, leftists will will you know they'll deplatform they'll they'll no platform people they will try and get uh, you know people's businesses destroyed uh, or they'll try and you know get people fired simply because they hold a, a, a political position contrary to their own because they've been indoctrinated into this relig religious sort of perspective that their position is correct and all others are perverse and it brings to mind uh, something that I saw uh, yesterday on YouTube uh, it was in during a Q&A uh, portion of a lecture given by Steven Pinker I don't know where it was being given but he made reference to uh, something he called the left pole if you haven't seen this video you can look it up uh, when I when I upload this I'll 
I'll add it as uh, I'll add a link to that particular um, that particular snippet of the lecture in the description of this video. But uh, the left pole, he he likened it to how when you're at the North Pole, everywhere else is south, right? So when you're at the left pole, when you're in a position, and this is increasingly true of the left. I don't know if it's necessarily so of the right, but. It's increasingly true of the left, if you're not in a particular small area, if you're not standing in a particularly small area, the left pole, everybody else outside of that left pole is on the right. You are you are necessarily on the right. Um, it's kind of kind of interesting. I I mean this might be a bit of a mixed metaphor, but I, I liken it to uh, the left is wearing an Overton monocle whereby their view of what is acceptable is so narrow that it's in a it's it's through a monocle now the only problem with that metaphor is that monocle is worn close to the eye so everything is in view um, so I don't know an Overton kaleidoscope an Overton telescope I don't know anyway Overton monocle I think is better but but yeah, no, I, I like Steven Pinker. I really wish I, I'd read more of his stuff and, I, and I, I should start watching some more of his, his stuff. He was, for me, he's kind of overshadowed um, by guys like Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, and Richard Dawkins. Shortly after the 9-11 attacks, the new atheist thinkers really sort of came on strong and, and, and took a a position in public discourse because of their alternative view to, um, you know, religious fundamentalism, which many people said, okay, two thousand uh, September 11th attacks, 2001, they're a result of religious fundamentalism first and foremost, not specifically Islam. It's become clear after 15 years and what, 30,000 attacks, 30,000 deaths from jihadists something like that, I don't know the specific statistic, that it's not simply religious fundamentalism, but a specific brand of religious fundamentalism. And here we speak back to the idea of alethophobia being uh, pervasive in religious ideology or religiously inspired ideology. You take into consideration the, um, the prescription for taqiyya in Islam. That is, in Islam, if you're not familiar with the term, it is permissible to lie about your faith, to even lie about your adherence to the faith of Islam. Uh, originally, it, the prescription was given to protect Muslims when they're in foreign lands, um, but Islamic scholars and others, and I think even Muhammad in, in one or two passages says it's okay to lie about the nature of Islam in order to gain the trust of your enemy, um, so that you might you know, gain their trust and then, you know, cut them at the neck. So, because there's a prescription in Islam for taqiyya, you are you're requesting or advising your adherents to lie about your faith. It stands to reason then that you lie enough about your faith, you're going to start to believe some of those lies. So when the truth about certain aspects of Islam become exposed, uh, it naturally sparks a, a visible reaction in many Muslims. So, if you want any evidence of this, just go and look on YouTube of people in, you know, in a debate setting or in a, in a forum setting, talking to Muslims about certain details like apostasy. And you can tell it makes them uncomfortable. Or talk to them about certain aspects of, of, of Muhammad. Uh, like, for instance, the fact that he, he married a six-year-old and consummated the marriage when she was nine. Um, talking about the fact that, you know, after Medina, the history of Islam is nothing but violent and nothing but one of conquest. And this will, you'll, you'll see that there is a physical discomfort they have with, um, with that sort of talk and, uh, and, and, it, and in some cases rage. And, I mean, if anybody knows anything about rage, rage is simply a response to fear. People become enraged when they're 
feel they're under attack. And that's a natural response to being afraid. So alethophobia. Um, depending on your level of religious devotion to your ideology or to your tribe, comes the greater tendency or the greater prevalence tendency towards uh, alethophobia. Anyway, look up alethophobia. Again, I wish I could remember the name of the author. It's, you know, it, it's not a Western European name, so it was very difficult to forget, or very difficult to remember, very easy to forget. But look it up, alethophobia. It's a novel written by this uh, Iranian American. Um, and look up the definition as well. The definition is taken directly from the novel. So anyway, uh, that's it for me today. Again, you can follow me on Twitter at Craig Bragg, C-R-A-G-G, B-R-A-G-G. Uh, right now, my name on Twitter is literally Putin. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's uh, Craig Bragg. Um, and uh, I have a Facebook page, which is Craig Bragg's uh, Jimmy Rustling Politics page. Um, there's not very many people on it, but uh, I, I post mostly, I mainly share on that page. Uh, I mainly share things that I find on YouTube or on Facebook uh, or on Twitter. And uh, occasionally I post my own thoughts. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, if, you, if this is the first time seeing a video here on this channel uh, and you like what you've heard me ramble on about on my drive home from work, um, hit like and subscribe. There I am shilling for my channel. All right. Have a good one.